it's kind of coming in and out. It's not on. It's not on. We can do Test, test, test. Oh. You want the handheld? Next week. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for a little brief conversation about the concert tomorrow night the Giants of the Orchestra. I'm William Interlegator, music director and conductor. And we're always happy to partner with the Laramie County Library in presenting these lunch and learn sessions. This one also seems to be coming in and out. We'll make do with the microphone situation. <laughs> we have a really great program tomorrow night for you. And we're going to talk about the pieces in concert order, which is rare for me. If you've been to these many times, you know. But there's so many great things to talk about and so many guests to feature in this. The program will begin with music by Aaron Copeland, his Quiet City, which is a special piece scored for just strings, solo trumpet, and solo English horn. And we have our wonderful English horn and trumpeter here from the Cheyenne Symphony. Please join me in welcoming Gina Johnson, Derek McDonald. It's so great to get a chance to feature our own symphony musicians on this concert, the two of you and Beth, our cellist, and get a chance to, you know, re-familiarize ourselves with you and your backgrounds and hear from you what you think about this piece. So uh, just briefly, why don't we start with Gina. Tell us a little bit about your background, um, where you're from originally, where you live now, how long you've been with the Cheyenne Symphony. Um, my background is I grew up down the road in Greeley, and you seem to have a note, I think. Um, so, um, down the road in Greeley, and I currently live in western Nebraska, so it's a hundred mile trip each time I come. Obviously, I love being here. So, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, a little bit about my, how I got started on this thing. It's, it's a hilarious story. I actually wanted to play the bassoon, so I started on clarinet, and uh, I chose the bassoon. And then came to tell the band director that I wanted to play bassoon. And he said, well, somebody's already chosen that. So I guess you get the oboe or the clarinet. So I like to joke that the oboe chose me instead. And I've been with the symphony for, I think, 20 years, I think? 20 something? Yes. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> And we featured you in the Strauss Concerto yep. about 10 years ago, maybe? Yeah, the Strauss Concerto almost exactly 10 years ago. So yep, that was a treat. That's great. And just briefly, because you did mention how you're our principal oboe, um, this, of course, is not an oboe. So this is like the tenor member of the oboe family, slightly bigger and lower voice than the oboe. Tell us a little bit of, briefly about the English one. Sure. So I nicknamed this the Beast actually, because, because it's a very different instrument. It requires different muscles, a whole different read. Um, so I am principal oboe here in Cheyenne, and uh, down the road in Fort Collins Symphony, I play second oboe in English horn. So, uh, so um, yeah, it is it is its own instrument, for sure. Yeah, and of course, it's featured quite a lot in a lot of the great orchestral repertoire, most notably in the Horshaw's New World Symphony, the slow movement. But in many other great pieces, the Swan of Tuonella by Sibelius, many others, the English horn, with its special voicing and register, has a lot of prominent parts. Um, but in this particular case, it's pretty unusual for Aaron Copeland to write a solo for English horn. And this might have been one of the first concerto-like features for the instrument ever written, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure, though. Do you know about that? Well, I don't know the history of English horn concerti. That I can confidently speak <laughs> against. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I did some research. I think this was originally written for trumpet and alto sax yeah. and clarinet and piano. So it's an interesting balancing balancing issue with a very efficient trumpet as far as sound production. If you're talking physics, um, the trumpet's super efficient with getting the sound out to y'all. English horn, the sound sits at my feet. And it's really an interesting <laughs> challenge on this one in particular. But yeah, it's really an interesting. Uh, it's fun. It's a neat challenge. I love, love rising to the occasion. Yeah. 
And I mean, there are probably some more modern um, English horn concertos, but normally the English horn has a place within the orchestra, or going back to the Baroque era, a predecessor of this in the more Baroque times would have been featured quite a bit in Bach's time, uh, more of a hunting kind of English horn kind of feature. And then Derek, you're featured quite a bit in the trumpet. Welcome. So Derek and Tom, you've been our principal trumpet for many years. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from, how long you've been with us, where you've been now, sure. the orchestras you play. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Uh, I moved out here in 2008 and uh, moved to Boulder. And I, I started grad school back then, and I've lived here ever since. Uh, I think I got the principal um, chair in Cheyenne in 2011 or 2012. One of the I can't on, I honestly cannot remember. I was taking <laughs> so many auditions around that time. And um, yeah, I played a lot of orchestras. I played the Colorado Ballet Orchestra. Or Collins Symphony, all of the young players in there. Uh, not, yeah. Uh, Greeley Philharmonic, the Floor uh, Chamber Orchestra, I substitute sometimes in the Modesto Symphony. Um, yeah, kind of all over the place. Um, I, I've been playing trumpet since I was 10, and I, like Gina, didn't originally want to play the trumpet. I actually wanted to play the saxophone. <laughs> but, Lisa Simpson and Billy Joel's saxophone player was really popular around that time, so everybody wanted to play saxophone, and there were already too many, and my band writer was like, can you do this? I was like, okay. He's like, take this and do this. And I was like, and he said, you're going to be a trumpet player. <laughs> oh, and I, 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 like, I was so trumpet was not cool. I said, it sounds like a sick elephant. <laughs> and I, 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 I took it home. My dad was like making fun of it, and, you know, like playing, you know, making funny noises. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so it kind of chose me as well, or my band director chose it. Uh, and, and I'm really happy because as time progressed, I was like, man, trumpet is a pretty cool instrument and saxophones. I mean, <laughs> 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 I don't know, it, it, it just happens. <laughs> Classical saxophone, there's something about it, you know? That's why it's very, it's very special in moments in history, like in history of that exhibition and stuff like that. But you wouldn't want to hear it constantly. Um, but trumpet, like, it, I don't know, it's cool, it's very versatile. I also do a lot of jazz, uh, I have done a lot of jazz in the past, and it, it's taken me many places. Um, yeah. And like in the case of Gina, I mean, to double on an oboe and an English horn, um, you also actually, it's interesting that many people don't realize this, but orchestral trumpet players have probably six or seven trumpets at home. Tell us a little bit about why that is and what, what the difference is on. Yeah, so like everybody's like, oh, you play trumpet. Oh, that must be nice. Whenever they're carrying around a $40,000 violin. And it's like, yes, but I have like seven of them, you know. And, <laughs> so it does add that. It's not quite the same as a $40,000 violin that you have to really take care of forever. But um, we have the piccolo trumpets, which is half half the, the length of this, and it's pitched an octave higher. This is the B-flat trumpet. It's kind of like the one that everybody starts on uh, whenever they begin. Um, so like kids in band, they play a B-flat trumpet. Um, in orchestra, I usually use my C trumpet, which I didn't even bring today. Um, I, I have a rotary trumpet, though, uh, that, that I use on the Mozart. So a rotary trumpet looks a little bit more like a French horn where it has rotor valves instead of pistons. You know, um, and I have an E flat trumpet uh, that comes with a set of different slides that pitches it in D, flugel horn, um, it, you know, like Chuck Mangione. Anybody familiar with Chuck Mangione? Yeah. He was a very famous flugel horn player. It's also used in brass band music and Latin jazz a lot. And Chet Baker made the flugel horn famous because he kept pawning one whenever he was in and out of jail. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so, so you, know, you have to have all those, and, and, and I, I have a nice collection at home. Um, sometimes I have to lend them out to my students. Yeah. You know. So like when we have a trumpet audition, for instance, oftentimes because one of the pieces we ask for is a, a, an older concerto that's pitched in E-flat and traditionally played on an E-flat trumpet, they have to bring that trumpet, the C trumpet, usually the piccolo trumpet, sometimes the B-flat. And so a trumpet audition, you have to actually schedule a little extra time for the player to have enough time to bring all these instruments, set them up on stage, warm up. 
Yeah, it, it, it adds up on your carry-on expenses. <laughs> Uh, like I have a quad case, and sometimes I have to bring like six trumpets or, or, or five trumpets, and then that doesn't fit in the quad. Then you're putting one on your seat above your head. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to kind of, and you have to have different mouthpieces for them all, and you have to kind of, you have to keep them all fresh on your face, because each one plays different, and there's a different intonation, and it's a different skill set. It's kind of a lot to, yeah. And then if you don't play one for a long time, you got to clean it out, you got to make sure it works. But yeah, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> well, we are so fortunate in the Cheyenne Symphony to have such wonderful players and to have an opportunity to feature them at the front of the stage is really special. Um, given the nature of the title of this piece, Quiet City, it might come as no surprise that this is a beautiful orchestral nocturne. Well, then you might be wondering, why is a trumpet involved in a nocturne, an instrument traditionally associated with waking people up sometimes? Uh, it's, that's a very valid question. Um, and uh, then the pairing of trumpet and English horn, as Gina said, they produce sound in a completely different way, and their tones are very different, and, but they're sort of bouncing off each other quite a bit in this piece, and so that's one of the key challenges. Sometimes we have to ask Derek to play a little softer, Gina play a little louder, and try to match in the middle kind of thing, and sometimes even they join each other on the same note, the same pitch, and it blends from one to the other. And, and that's, again, part of the challenge. And all of this is backed up by the strings playing a beautiful part as well. And for the performance tomorrow night, we have something extra special. We also have images of the night sky taken by local photographer Judith Myers that will be projected on the back of the uh, orchestra shell. So to sort of put you in the mood and to actually even to also see those photo the wonderful photography that Judy did, we actually uh, will have the lights on the, st on the stage a little dimmed. So tell us a little bit about your history with this piece, because it's my understanding that most trumpet players and oboe players have played this piece a lot on like master's recitals and grad school. It's sort of, sort of a standard piece that you, you know, like almost have to play. Um, and, and tell us a little bit about that. Um, this is actually, I can't tell if this is my fourth or fifth performance of this. So I did it on at least two master's trumpet recitals back when I was at UNC, um, and possibly three. <laughs> you lose track for a while. Um, and then I've also done it with symphonic band as well. So, but this is my first time with the symphony orchestra, and each time brings its own unique set of eases and challenges. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And from a trumpeter standpoint, is this piece considered super important? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this piece, um, I, I first heard of it years ago, whenever, um, I was an undergrad, and, and somebody, a trumpet player, was interested in dating an oboe player, and so he programmed this on his recital, and, and you know, they, they didn't end up together. He ended up with a horn player. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so that, that was the first time I, I was exposed to this piece, and I have actually never performed this. This would be my first performance. I was scheduled to perform it with the Boulder Chamber Orchestra uh, in 2020, but we had pandemic and then it was never uh, rescheduled. So I was really excited whenever whenever they, the opportunity came up to do it here. I've worked on it and I've taught it, you know, many times to my students and stuff, but I, I this is my first like premiere performance of it. So it's, I'm really excited to do it. Wonderful. And maybe you guys can play a little bit of um, your respective parts and um, we can talk a little bit about maybe some of the different roles that you have in the story that maybe you're trying to tell with this piece, or any other observations that you would want to share too. Do you need a little time to warm up, or are you guys good? Uh, I'm okay. So. All right. You could start while she does that, and just, uh, yeah, I'll grab the mic, and I can help you. If you want to speak about that, I'll it out for you. Okay. Um, one of the things that's so interesting about this piece is that the trumpet has a sort of non-human, ethereal, otherworldly kind of call, would you say? Yeah. And, and it sort of bookends the piece. It's a 10-minute piece, and um, a lot of things happen in the middle, but the beginning and the end are somewhat similar. Um, and it's really a, a special and important trumpet part, which is perhaps inspired by Charles Ives' Unanswered Question, which has a similar kind of questioning of uh, existence kind of, kind of quality. Right. Any other thoughts about this opening? Uh, yeah, so um, 
the, the words underneath the, um, the first phrase says nervous, mysterious. And what, what the, the trumpet is, is a character in this play that was written, uh, Quiet City, um, that Coleman wrote music for. Um, it, it was just originally incidental music. And so the trumpet is sig signifying the character who himself plays trumpet, um, and he's a nervous person. He's, he's battling with going between his, you know, his uh, cultural heritage and changing the Catholicism out of being, you know, Jewish, and, and he's, his whole life is, is changing. And so this is kind of like his like beginning moments in the city where he's he, he's very scattered and. and and, and not really sure of what how it's going, and, and the the English horn is the complement to him playing playing more um, like while while the trumpet is more I guess kind of nervous and loud. The, the English horn plays kind of like the subdued character underneath it, uh, underneath his um, conscience. So anyway, the, the opening is, is kind of neat, and, and it, take a little bit of liberty and rubato with it. It's a very interesting call and response. Um, I get to echo a lot of what Derek does, and yet the English horn does indeed have its own parts. Um, it, ha it introduces new melodies, um, it leads the strings. It's just really its own essence throughout the entire piece. And, um, and then there is that one point in time where we do have a lot of unison notes. Not that you'll hear them in the performance, but you'll just see me play. <laughs> just because the trumpet is so loud. So, yeah, that's just the nature of it. Don't you don't look at the score. We actually have the same notes. But, um, but the response, um, it's a very interesting storyline where the nervousness of this forming the new life and then the call almost to... I kind of liken it, you know, we all have this point in our lives where we look and see, who am I really? And then there's this inner conflict that goes on between the familiar and then moving into the new person. So I, I kind of liken it that way to where between the two of us, even though we're friends, the music is, <laughs> is a bit of an inner struggle and a conflict as well. So. So my part's a little less nervous, a little more fluid, a little more calm, and then suddenly it isn't at some point in time. Right. Yeah. 
but it has an, almost like a wisdom to it, too, right? And there's a long history of English horn kind of being used in call and response, most famously perhaps in the Symphony Fantastique, um, where there's this idea of like shepherds on different mountains calling to each other, and the English horn is sort of that typical thing they might use. Yeah. So, yeah. I have this very precocious 15-year-old, and one day she said to me, Mom, what does the oboe do in the orchestra? And I said, well, we give the tuning A, and we do this, and we play a lot of transitions. And she said, no, 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 like if I were, sorry, if I were a composer and I wanted to write for oboe, <laughs> what do I do? And I said, well, we help people fall in love, you know, things like that. <laughs> and, but it was an interesting question that got me thinking, and I said, what happens when the English horn plays? And it's one of two things. Either people fall deeply in love, or somebody's about to die. So, <laughs> <laughs> not here. Not here. <laughs> Imagine me as a, 
a kind of feisty uh, elementary school kid with my trumpet um, in New Mexico. My favorite hobby after school, because we lived at a four-way stop sign, was to try to disrupt traffic with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I turned 11, uh, I went down to see what my present was going to be, and it was a cello. The trumpet was gone <laughs> forever. They took it from me. It was uh, confiscated. <laughs> well, I had mixed feelings, but I um, I showed an immediate like propensity for the cello, and I got to be quite good at it early on. So um, you know, my high school years, uh, I'd have. In New Mexico, we'd have Wednesdays for skiing, and then Thursdays would be my cello lesson in Albuquerque, and so I only went to school three days a week, and it seemed pretty great. Um, so from uh, that, I, <laughs> I went to school at Rice University as a, as a, um, a, a college student, a double major in chemistry and music. And in my second year at Rice, a quartet came from New York City, and the cellist really liked me. And he said, you know, we give you a free ride to Manhattan School if you'd like to come. And so I thought, oh, I guess I'll try it. So I went up to Manhattan, I left chemistry behind, and then it's been cello ever since. So I studied back east. Um, I met <laughs> in my early years in college. I was I went to a summer program, and um, was assigned to a string quartet, this really cute violinist who became my husband, and he still is. Um, so we were assigned together. Um, then various jobs here and there. Um, and my last one, which I just absolutely love, is here with the Cheyenne Symphony and as cello professor at the University of Wyoming. Oh. So that's my story. And your husband, John, is also on the faculty. Yes, my beloved husband, John, is on the faculty, a uh, violin professor. So here in Wyoming, I teach cello. I play in a lot of orchestras. I do summer festivals in North Carolina and in Virginia. Um, but I also like sporty things. And I'm happy to be honored to report that I was um, chosen through a race to represent the state of Wyoming in the National Senior Games in Cycling. And I got fifth place in the national. <laughs> yes, and I, I have a horse. I love horse stuff. In fact, I might have told this story before, but when I was in high school, I said to my mom, I'm too busy for the cello. I want to do my equestrian stuff and just um, stick with that. I was the state jumping champion in New Mexico. And my mom said, Honey, the day you quit the cello is the day we sell your horse. So, so I stuck with it. That's what I say. Yeah. Um, so here in Wyoming, I have a horse. I do all kinds of fun horse stuff. And it's not the only horse uh, back riding thing that you've done recently. I'm thinking about the picture of you near the pyramids. It was like a horse bike oh, thing. Yes. It's about riding camels. That was pretty fun. So. Last year I was on sabbatical. Thank you, University of Wyoming, for my sabbatical. And my husband and I decided that we had projects that we could do. He was on sabbatical too, wherever we wanted. And we decided to get away and do it somewhere else. So we, our journeys took us to uh, Greece, where we lived for several months, and Lebanon, where my husband has family, and then I wanted to go to Egypt. So we went to Egypt, and uh, it was pretty fun. Um, in Luxor, I rode a camel, and I thought, this is not a very fast camel. And so, the next time, when we were at the pyramids, I asked the guy, dude, I need a faster camel. And so he gave me one, and I was like, yalla, yalla. But it wasn't, it wasn't really all that fast. And so I, I came back, and I said, excuse me, but do you have anything faster? And so they gave me their fastest camel, and it was pretty fast. <laughs> I think that's the picture I saw. <laughs> that was fun, yeah. Well, um, we're so lucky to have you in the orchestra, yes. and 
thank you for being willing to play this very unusual cello concerto. As a cellist, I mean, you, you study all the great concertos from, of course, Haydn through, you know, Dvorak, Elgar, and all the other greatest hits. There's some incredible concertos. But Tan Dun is, um, this is uh, one that's, you know, relatively newer. Um, this is music taken from the film score that he wrote in 2000 for the film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. The soundtrack uh, of which had Yo-Yo Ma featured quite a bit. And so he extracted a cello concerto from the movie and it was premiered by Yo-Yo Ma. And, um, and it's unlike any other cello solo you'll ever hear, I think. Yeah. Yes, that's true. So Ang Lee made this beautiful movie in 2000 called Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And it was one of the seminal, like, really cool martial arts movies. One of the first ones to make, just after The Matrix, with this kind of gravity-defying martial arts stuff. But Ang Lee had also done all kinds of beautiful period um, Jane Austen things. And so this movie is just gorgeous. A kind of period drama set in, in Imperial China. And the soundtrack um, employs a lot of sounds from the uh, Chinese instruments. In fact, I think Ang Lee, in the early days of his life, uh, he, he, during the Cultural Revolution, he had to work as a laborer on a farm, and he couldn't do his composition, so he was taught. Yeah, Tandu. Yeah. You said Ang Lee, the director. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Tandu. So he learned all these, uh, play these uh, ethnic instruments, and you'll find uh, echoes of those that I'll show you in, in the score. Um, he later was able to go to the conservatory and became one of China's great um, composers at that time. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. So, and, and it's a story that's similar to another um, Chinese American composer we played recently, Chen Yi. Uh, they both were born around the same time in China, and they both, in their teenage years, were not allowed to study Western instruments or even traditional Chinese instruments, but sent to work on like rice farms and things of that nature. But then a, a cultural shift happened in the early 70s, and they opened the Beijing Central Conservatory of Music. And in its first composition class, Tan Dun was one of the members, as was Chen Yi. Um, and they both ended up going from there on to study and get PhDs at Columbia University in New York City. Um, and, uh, and so both of these composers are able to infuse their music with a combination of Eastern and Western like nothing you've ever heard before. Not just because of their cultural heritage, but also because of perhaps that time that they spent away from music or having to create folk instruments or listen to folk music while they were working on the farms and communes. So that was a whole interesting aspect of his background, yeah. And one thing you'll notice in this concerto is that the cello is amplified. It's written for amplified cello. And that enables the cello to create uh, an atmosphere without as much struggle that's more, you know, exotic and flute-like, I think. When we say struggle, it's because the accompaniment group in the orchestra can sometimes be loud. Beth doesn't have to struggle to be heard over it. She, unlike in some other concertos where a soloist has to project and work really hard, and the composer has to be very careful in the scoring of the accompaniment not to overpower the solo part. In this case, Tan Dun has said the entire concerto will be amplified. And even in these sections, we want to amplify more. <laughs> so it has a different kind of sound, too, just coming through an amplifier. Um, and also, the scoring of the orchestra is unique as well. We have strings, um, but we also have harp. We have um, a flute player who never gets to play flute. He, he only, Ismael, our flutist, will play piccolo, the small flute, and alto flute, the very large flute. And the alto flute, which is also a very soft instrument, also is specified in the score to be amplified. And then there is a number of percussion instruments, a wide range of percussion. Um, they make some amazing sounds. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit more. Do you want to play a little example or tell us a little more? Yeah, I'll play maybe a bit from the very opening. It's kind of a solo cello soliloquy, but as you'll hear, it sounds very um, disturbing. Yes.
why there's so much of that ending of notes is um, that the piece is actually written in a way so that the cello can emulate the Chinese instrument, the air hu, which does not have a traditional fingerboard like we're used to seeing on our string instruments, and which does do a lot of bending. In fact, um, the score even specifies that it could be for solo cello or air hu. Um, the air hu instrument um, has a totally different kind of look and sound, but you, we're trying to almost emulate that here. Um, and yet, in the very original soundtrack, it was Yo-Yo Ma playing a cello. So it's interesting. There, there's a kind of almost like a indecisiveness where we're going Eastern or Western with this part. Um, and it's a beautiful blend of both. There's this, the Western instrument, the cello itself, and uh, you know, playing in a very different style, emulating the Arhu. Yeah. And then there's some parts where he gets you to play some very interesting pizzicato and the guitar pick. Yeah. That would be great. Another uh, Chinese instrument, which I think is called mm -hmm. right? Um, which is kind of like a Chinese ukulele with a really long neck. Um, I've never played one, but I think <laughs> this, this section is supposed to emulate that. Yeah. Um, so the score calls for the cellist to hold the guitar pick in the mouth like this, <laughs> and then do this. <laughs> So there's, uh, but then there's a whole other extended condense, and it's all written by Tom Dunn. And um, some of the techniques involved in that are pretty extraordinary as well. Anything in particular you want to demonstrate from either of those condenses? Um, well, the, the first one he's talking about, that's the duet with the tar, is going to be fun because Tom Dunn asks the the tar is to come out dancing. Yeah, so, so the tar is a kind of talking drum that can make a different pitches. And yeah, it's specified in the part that the drummer has to walk and sort of dance from the back of the stage to the front and have a little and duet. And then we have a jam session, which yeah. just sounds <laughs> Yes, right, yes. So he'll be doing his thing while all this stuff goes on. <laughs> So they're 
there's a movement here, number four, that's called the Eternal Vow, which is a very beautiful uh, melody. And at the end of this soothing melody comes the kind of jarring cadenza. Um, so be aware. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just play like the last, um, the last string of it. <laughs>
percussion instrument, well, five of them, really, five separate timpani drums, um, each with an upside down suspended cymbal on it that then is played by a bass bow. You know the bow of a, a string bass? So boom, they do that to the cymbal. It resonates and it vibrates the timpani drum and it makes a very interesting kind of ethereal, mysterious effect. Um, and so they each of the five percussionists gets a chance to do that. Then we hear things like bongos and rototoms and bass drum and the tar talking drum that we talked about earlier. Um, so there's unusual techniques, um, which kind of go in line with what Tan Dun does with a lot of his music. He writes for sometimes unusual instruments or traditional instruments with unusual techniques. Some of his other pieces are written for things like water percussion or paper instruments. Or he has a cool orchestral piece that's all about birds, and at one part of it, the audience uses their cell phones. Um, so he's <laughs> full of interesting new ideas and new sounds that can be experienced in an orchestral setting. Um, so this is really exciting. I think this might be one of our first times as the Cheyenne Symphony playing music by Tom Dunn. Um, so it's really, really exciting. Other things that you wanted to mention, Beth? No? No, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Yeah, bravo. You're so fantastic, and it's great to feature you in this. Um, I'm, I might be second-guessing our audience, but I was wondering if they might be wondering about your instrument. But just because string, play, string instruments oftentimes have an interesting provenance, and, and, and you know, sometimes really old or anything. Anything special you want to share about your instrument or your bow? Or? Um, I'm playing on this beautiful Italian cello, which um, is from 1870. It's a Vincenzo Postiglione. Wow. And I got it, oh, I don't know, 25 years ago when it was still possible for a poor Musician. person to get an instrument. <laughs> um, and I, in those days, I'm sorry to say, I did sell my soul a little bit to get it. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I got it back, though. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. You have such a distinctive, great sound, and it's partially it's partially the instruments, but yeah. Well, again, we're so fortunate to have you in New York. Show great to feature you, and thank you for taking on this challenge of a piece which, like I said, I'm sure you've never had studied before. I asked you to play it, and is all new, right? Yeah, bravo. Yeah. Mozart's Jupiter Symphony as the second half of, of the program tomorrow night. And this is a piece that obviously in its nickname, Jupiter, ties in with our season theme of the universe and stars. And just to give you, a, you know, to mention, next month we're going to have a lot of that. Because next month we're performing the planets, we're performing an aria called Ain't It a Pretty Night, we're performing Claire de Lune, the moonlight of Debussy, and even a piece called Mothership about a spaceship taking off. <laughs> yes. But we're really getting into the mood for this space theme with, um, it, you know, we're working our way up to it. Now, the Jupiter nickname of Mozart's symphony wasn't originated by Mozart, and it really has nothing to do with the planet. Honestly, it's just a cute little tie into our theme. Because um, Mozart wrote this symphony in 1788, and it didn't have that nickname until an English uh, concert promoter um, by the name of Solomon, the same gentleman who knew Franz Joseph Haydn and invited Haydn to London to perform and to compose and perform the London symphonies. He's the one who conducted a performance of this, or arranged for a performance of this Mozart symphony in the 18, I think it was 1813, and nicknamed it Jupiter, and the nickname stuck. And why did he choose that? Because as the sort of king of the Roman gods, he thought that this was the sort of the ultimate uh, in Mozart's symphonies, and perhaps in classical era symphonies as a whole. So it has this kind of, yes, it has a kind of ceremonial, kind of majestic quality. So in some ways, Solomon was right to give it this nickname. But in some ways, I think the nickname is really misleading, because when we think of, um, you know, Jupiter as the, the Roman god, we kind of tend to think that this is not a piece about human emotions. It's absolutely a piece about us, not the gods. <laughs> um, so many interesting stories about this piece and mysteries about this piece. The first of which is, why did Mozart write it? So in 1788, Mozart was very busy juggling many other commissions and new pieces that he was writing. It was unusual for him to write a symphony 
let alone three symphonies, because in the summer of 1788, in two months period of time, he wrote symphony number 39, 40, and 41. None of them had a performance uh, or an actual like engagement or a commission. They all just came because he had to write them. Um, it's very unusual because, again, this was the time when Mozart was at the height of his powers, but the depth of his poverty. He needed commissions. He needed public performances. He needed income. It was shortly after writing these symphonies he started writing these really heartbreaking letters to his fellow mason, Michael Puchberg, begging for money and things like that. So it's a mystery that Mozart would take the time to write these three gems, his last three symphonies, although he may not have known that they would be his last three symphonies when he wrote them. And like I said, there was no known public performance of them at the time. So why did he write them? And um, the interesting thing also is that the three symphonies are kind of like triplets. They born at the same time, in some ways similar, in some ways different. Um, so uh, the symphony number 40, for instance, the, the G minor symphony that came right before the Mozart, the, right before the Jupiter symphony, pardon me, um, that's one full of like overt passion, intensity. It's one of the few Mozart symphonies in a minor key. Um, this one has, a, on the surface of things, very different kind of quality. It starts very ceremonial. It has the trumpets and drums that are traditionally associated with C major and outdoor concerts and the court and uh, aristocracy, sometimes the church. And so the opening sounds like this. This to play for you. Um, sorry. <laughs> sometimes just literally fragments and blocks, and put it into something that's incredible, like to create and weave some kind of magical, incredible whole out of that, that's better than the sum of its parts. You may have also notice that right at the very beginning we had a loud declaration followed by a soft response. And that reminds me that this piece was written at a time of war. Actually, the war that was going on between the, the you know, the, in, in Vienna and Turkey, that was kind of getting in the way of some of Mozart's income as well. Um, there was some struggle going on by everybody at that time because of the war. And so there's perhaps a little bit of that. I like to think of the soft response as being like the more human side, the sort of you know, wishing for peace or the more kind of heart yearning after the big magisterial opening. Let's listen to that again. Because you have a very public statement followed by something very personal, it sounds like. Here it is. <laughs> intensity too, but intensity in a different way, not the big pomp and public kind of intensity, but something more personal. You also notice that it stated something, and then it raised up a pitch, 
Well, it's interesting that Mozart does that in almost every movement of this piece, where he'll state that little fragment of a melody and then play it again higher, and then start to vary it right away. It, it's really important to understand that at this time, Mozart was also geeking out about the music of Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. And so he was studying Bach's music, and he was fascinated by the idea of counterpoint variation. And so right on the top of the bat, we get some variation. We hear something that's varied, it's uh, repeated again, slightly different. Well, throughout this symphony, but especially in the last movement, he's going to experiment more and more with different lines, working uh, musical lines, playing together, and doing unusual things. The last movement of this symphony is considered by many scholars to be the greatest example of counterpoint in any symphony ever written because he takes five little tiny musical fragments. Well, some of them are a little bit more than fragments. The, the very first thing you'll hear is which was a well-known little melody at the time, used by many composers. But then there are things like and or these little tiny snippets he actually weaves into one of the most incredible symphonic movements ever written from a standpoint of counterpoint, from a standpoint of expression. And I wondered sometimes to myself, like, why did he embrace this um, Bach model and this counterpoint so intensely in this piece? Why was he doing it? Was it just a, like an intellectual exercise to see if he could out Bach Bach? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I, I honestly think he was trying to find a new way to heighten the intensity of expression. And he thought maybe bringing back the counterpoint of the Baroque era and doing it in a style that only his genius mind could figure out could do that. So, um, so we have a lot of counterpoint in this piece running throughout. Um, and yeah, I, I might jump to that last movement so you can hear a little bit of that. Okay, so far it's like everybody's playing the same thing, right? It's sort of establishing a baseline, and then it's going to go off the deep end from there. First, there's going to be a little few. Different instruments of the strings come in, one after another, separated by several bars. And then he's going to do what we like to call a cannon, where something is like row, row, row your boat, row, row, row your boat, where the entrances come right after each other. So you have ba 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 but it's ba 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 and they all do it. And so he's really just starting to show off, but it's nothing compared to what's going to happen at the end. And I know I'm running out of time here. I'm going to jump to the moment that's near the end of this piece, where he combines all of the five moments, all of the five little musical fragments together for the first time, all at once. And it's like you're listening to something that is like the high point of human achievement. It's like the musical version of a Mona Lisa or some other great thing that you, that you know we can almost be proud to be human of, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the Sistine Chapel ceiling or, or something like that. So we're coming up to that moment, and it's brief when he does this. The thing to remember is that this is not just an intellectual exercise. This is his way of trying to bring out more intensity in the music, and even if you're not aware of it all, you can kind of feel something that in this music that makes you want to be more alive. It makes you happy to be alive. It, it's just it's thrilling. So here it comes. So right now we're just two of the themes together. Here come all five. Wow. 
And throughout the movements, there are other parts of incredible intensity, parts that sound very much like Don Giovanni, which was his opera that had just been written and premiered in Prague and then performed in Vienna. Um, there's an incredible part of the second movement where there's this turn to the minor, and it's just these series of chords. It almost sounds either like Don Giovanni or his Requiem, uh, where it's passionate and intense. Um, and so there are really good reasons to think of this as maybe one of the greatest symphonies ever written. And I know I'm running out of time. I wish I could geek out about it more and more. There's a lot more to tell you about it. Thank you all for being here. Thank you again to our wonderful soloist, Tina and Jared. And Thank you all for